the so-called democratic rebels, you know, they are very, very numerous in this international hotel saloon. Can you tell me where ISIS is in Hama or Homs? Can you name the locations? I am not going to name every spot because you don't no, know that. No, I just that asked that. you two no, spots. No, 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 I'm sorry. You don't know at the same time where they are because they move I just spoke rapidly. to the rebels in no, northern no, Hama have, this morning. Okay. Who did you speak you to this there? morning? Were you there? No, you had a phone call from somebody who tells what he wants to tell as you. As the U.S. government and, confirmed. As well as the U.S. government. I don't trust the U.S. government. Oh, but that. you trust the Syrian government, I do don't you? trust the Syrian either. What I do is I well, what see. What you just said is exactly I see, a propaganda that, coming Michael, out of Damascus. If you don't, if you want to do, to speak alone, you speak alone. But you are not going to say the truth. The truth. Well, no, is, I'm hearing lies. This truth, is why I'm speaking against them. The truth is that for the five years, you know, we have been told in France and in Europe we are going to get rid of Bashar. You know, in this Syrian army, you have 80 percent of the Sunnites. Secondly, there are all the Christian minority who support this regime. Of course, he has got opponents, but those opponents, they are mainly al Nusra, bound to Al-Qaeda, and the Islamic State. So there is no surprise. Assad and that the Islamic the Russian... State have been ignoring each other, according to Jane's defense, as of June 2014. You Americans the number have of sources... created the This Islamic is a British state. firm I'm quoting now. Well, okay. okay. The Islamic State we has created been created the Islamic state? by the American policy. The fundings that uh, Bashar Saudi al-Assad's Mukhabarat was sending jihadists no, no, no. into I'm Iraq sorry. to blow up American this soldiers for today, eight this years. Is very okay, let... We have a devil to combat. This is the yes, Islamic his name state. is Bashar al-Assad, sir. No, no, no. I That's think you should rename point. your organization you the Friends out, of Assad delegation out of, of the French game Parliament. By saying that. This week, we saw a humiliating final act in the American experiment on Afghanistan. U.S. military planes took off from Kabul as the hands of desperate Afghans tried to latch on to them. We saw images of them scaling up walls to escape. We saw harrowing videos of their bodies falling on the tarmac. We saw parents handing over their children to complete strangers. The world hung its head in shame. But in Washington, there was no sign of remorse. You don't think this could have been handled, this actually could have been handled better in any way, no mistakes. We're going to go back in hindsight and look, but the idea that somehow there's a way to have gotten out without chaos ensuing, I don't know how that happens. It's a cold-hearted betrayal, one that should weigh heavily on American conscience, because this unfolding tragedy is a collective failure shared by generations of U.S. presidents, policymakers, and military commanders they helped create the monster of the Taliban, and after 20 years of failing to control it, they have unleashed it back on the people of Afghanistan. Hello and welcome to Gravitas Plus. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay, and I come to you with one of the most closely guarded secrets of the Cold War. The role of America in supporting Afghan warlords, or the Mujahideen, who ultimately went on to form the Taliban. In December 1979, when the Cold War was at its peak, the Soviet Union decided to invade Afghanistan under the pretext of upholding the Soviet-Afghan Friendship Treaty of 1978. America could not help but fling itself into the conflict and support the Afghan Mujahideen to safeguard its interests. This is the official story. At that time, the American people were completely unaware that their government, together with the British Secret Service, the MI6, had begun training and funding Islamic extremists, including the man who destroyed the Twin Towers in New York, Osama bin Laden. Many dismissed this as a conspiracy theory. It's not. In 2005, British Foreign Secretary Robin Cook himself admitted in writing that Osama bin Laden was a product of a monumental miscalculation by Western security forces, that he was armed by the CIA and funded by America's Western allies to fight the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. These claims were reiterated by Benazir Bhutto, the slain Prime Minister of Pakistan, and Prince Bandar bin Sultan of Saudi Arabia. They both publicly acknowledged that Osama bin Laden was a product of American spy agencies. So the U.S. helped Osama bin Laden and his fighters, and the Western media sang praises of his operations. It was around the same time that the concept of jihad, or holy war, found its way into the global lexicon. Media reports backed the Mujahideen. They portrayed Soviets as Christians who were trying to defile Islam. The term Mujahideen itself broadly translates to an Islamic struggle a struggle bankrolled by the Americans who wanted to turn Afghanistan into the Soviet Union's Vietnam. As for the Soviet occupation, it lasted for a decade, and throughout this period, the CIA kept expanding its program, codenamed Operation Cyclone. 
Washington funneled millions of dollars to the Mujahideen with the help of Pakistan. In 1980, the Carter administration allocated $30 million. In 1985, the Reagan administration allocated $250 million. And by 1987, annual American aid to the Mujahideen had reportedly reached $630 million. The money was flowing. What about the weapons? Initially, America was against supplying weapons, primarily because it wanted to keep the operation covert. Also because it feared that other countries would access its technology. But in March 1985, President Reagan's national security team formally decided to switch its strategy and began providing the Mujahideen with the Stringer anti-aircraft missile. Pakistan's inter-services intelligence, the ISI, controlled the distribution and transport of these weapons into the war zones. They would arrive at the port of Karachi, be taken to depots near Rawalpindi and Quetta and smuggled across the Afghan border. By 1989, when the last Soviet soldier walked out of Afghanistan, America had funneled $20 billion into Afghanistan in arms and ammunition. $20 billion. Then the Soviet Union disintegrated, the Cold War ended, and with it, America's appetite for funding the Mujahideen also ended. It dropped Afghanistan like a hot potato. The country became the very picture of chaos. You see, the Mujahideen had many factions. They worked together till the U.S. supported them. When the U.S. left, they began fighting each other. Civil war followed. It destroyed most of Kabul. And from this civil war emerged a young group of Mujahideen in Kandahar. They portrayed themselves as an army of Robin Hood. They said their purpose was restoring peace and justice. They called themselves the Taliban, meaning students. It's a word in the Pashto language. But whose students were they? The Taliban were former Mujahideen who worked for the United States but had become disillusioned with the internal disputes. So they moved to Pakistan to study at Islamic seminaries, mainly the Deobandi School of Islam. The US played no direct role in this, in the formation of the Taliban, yes. But the Taliban flourished mainly due to the environment created by the Americans and there's no denying this. An environment that justified the cause of Islamic extremists, of picking up arms to protect their faith and country. The Americans taught them to do this. The Taliban or students only implemented those lessons. They grew into the most potent force in Afghanistan. Afghans who were tired of the Mujahideen's excesses and infighting embraced the Taliban when they first emerged. They relied on this group to restore peace and wipe out corruption. This allowed the Taliban to gain power, to enforce an austere version of the Sharia law. But from here, things went downhill. They took Afghanistan to the Stone Age. And the US, which had helped create this monster, simply watched on. It woke up only when the monster struck home. Osama bin Laden, with the protection of the Taliban, carried out the 9-11 attacks, the biggest and the most horrific terror strike the world had ever seen. More than 2,900 people were killed. The attack shook the US. It asked the Taliban to hand over Osama. The Taliban refused. What did Washington do? invaded Afghanistan with this promise. And now the Taliban will pay a price. The US promised to make the Taliban pay. But look at what they did. They dethroned the Taliban to replace it with the Taliban. At what cost? 20 years of war, $3 trillion spent, 2,300 American soldiers killed, 75,000 Afghan soldiers and Americans killed, and this superpower fled in the dead of night. They could not root out the Taliban. They could not dismantle the terror networks. They could not even rebuild Afghanistan. Now, Joe Biden says that was never the aim, but he must listen to what his predecessors said. Doesn't help his case. The Afghan people, as you stand up, you will not stand alone. It establishes the basis for our cooperation over the next decade, including shared commitments to combat terrorism and strengthen democratic institutions. It supports Afghan efforts to advance development, and dignity for their people. For a moment, let's put their hypocrisy and lies aside and understand why the US failed in Afghanistan. I could think of several reasons. First of all, America was fighting the wrong enemy. It went after the Taliban, while the root cause of the problem was Pakistan. There's stark evidence of the ISI's involvement every step of the way, giving the Taliban both financial and military training. The Americans knew it, but acknowledged it too late. Reason number two, failing to understand the Afghan context. The U.S. went to war without understanding the social, economic and political dynamics of Afghanistan. It tried imposing formal rule of law in a country that addresses most of its disputes through informal means. 
It tried forcing Western models on Afghan institutions. It trained Afghan forces in weapon systems they could neither understand nor maintain. Money cannot buy everything. The U.S. learned this the hard way. Reason number three, America's endless appetite for wars. Barely a year after it invaded Afghanistan, the U.S. diverted its attention to Iraq, which it insisted was a greater threat. This shift allowed the Taliban to regroup and to resume the war against U.S.-led NATO forces. Reason number four, legitimizing the Taliban. Talks and terror don't go hand in hand, but for the U.S. they do. In 2011, the Obama administration allowed the Taliban to move to Qatar and establish a diplomatic office to hold what they called peace talks. Where is the peace? This move made the Taliban feel like winners. A terror group was allowed to negotiate on its own terms. The U.S. messed up even in its withdrawal from Afghanistan. It first called the troops back allowed the Taliban to gain turf, left its weapon systems unattended and is now trying to evacuate Afghans in danger. But the US did no such thing. It allowed Afghanistan to crumble into a pile of broken promises. All of this could have been avoided. The gut-wrenching scenes at Kabul airport, the harrowing images of bodies falling from skies, of Afghan men scaling up walls to flee, of Afghan women handing their babies to soldiers, of security forces shamefully surrendering to the Taliban, all of this could have been avoided. America's botched-up retreat from Afghanistan is criminal. This is Joe Biden's legacy. He presided over the demise of a superpower. Ten years ago, a man believed to be Abu Musab al-Zarqawi released this video, declaring himself the head of al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia. Today, as Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump campaign for the U.S. presidency, I call President Obama and Hillary Clinton the founders of ISIS. They're the founders. The decade-old Al-Qaeda propaganda video is a reminder of the origins of the Islamic State, or ISIS, and its ties to the militant group founded by Osama bin Laden. During the Bush administration, in the middle of the U.S. occupation, al-Zarqawi was the most wanted man in Iraq. He declared a holy war against the U.S.-backed Iraqi government. Car and suicide bombings were rampant. His vision was to create a strict Islamic State. His zealous Sunni followers pledged allegiance to al-Qaeda and joined him in a brutal insurgency. Their tactics included filming the beheadings of hostages and posting them online. This is the translated version of a 2005 letter written by al-Zarqawi's superior, Ayman al-Zawahiri, then second in command to Osama bin Laden. It reveals early signs of a coming split between the two groups. In the letter, al-Zawahiri told his subordinate not to be so brutal. Al-Zarqawi was killed in June 2006 in a U.S. airstrike, but the group survived through the years, through the U.S. surge during President Bush's second term, amid increasing sectarian Iraqi politics, and ultimately after President Obama's withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq. By 2013, the group had renamed itself ISIS and began attracting new recruits as part of a rebellion against the neighboring Syrian regime. In 2014, the group debuted on the world stage and formally cut ties with al-Qaeda over religious doctrine and their brutal military tactics. That summer, ISIS gained control of Raqqa in Syria and Mosul, Iraq's second largest city. On the first day of Ramadan in 2014, ISIS declared a caliphate and soon after Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi became its caliph. With the group swiftly spreading further into Iraq, President Obama authorized airstrikes. Today I authorized two operations in Iraq. Targeted airstrikes to protect our American personnel and a humanitarian effort to help save thousands of Iraqi civilians who are trapped on a mountain without food and water and facing almost certain death. Over the last two years, local forces in the U.S.-led coalition against ISIS have sought to retake territory from the militant group and liberate Syrians and Iraqis trapped under its control. The coalition has retaken Ramadi and Fallujah in Iraq. And in August, it retook Membij, a key Syrian city along the route to the Islamic State's self-declared capital of Raqqa.
The Palestinian militant group Hamas has carried out brutal acts of terror against Israeli civilians. And Israeli and American leaders are always keen to tell us how dangerous and evil Hamas is. The inhumanity of Hamas. I have no sympathy for Hamas. That keep shelling Israel with thousands of uh, rockets and uh, mortar shells. But what if I told you that Israel helped create Hamas? Officially, Hamas, which is the acronym for an Arabic phrase meaning Islamic Resistance Movement, was founded in 1987, at the start of the first Palestinian Intifada, or uprising, against the Israeli occupation. But its roots were planted much earlier. The Hamas founder, Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, was a half-blind, disabled Palestinian cleric and member of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Brotherhood had been repressed by the Egyptians in Gaza prior to 1967. But once the Israelis invaded and occupied the Strip, they didn't just turn a blind eye to these Islamists, they encouraged them. See, the Israelis, especially right-wing Israelis, wanted to undermine the power of the dominant Palestinian political force at that time, the nationalist PLO, at the heart of which was the secular Fatah party of Yasser Arafat, their bête noire. <laughs> By empowering Sheikh Yassin and the Muslim Brotherhood, Israeli leaders thought they could divide and rule the occupied Palestinians, play them off against each other, secular nationalists against religious Islamists. So in 1978, when Yassin wanted to officially register his Islamic association, which was basically the precursor to Hamas, the Israelis were only too keen to help. Yassin built and grew a network of Islamist social institutions across Gaza, including schools and clubs and mosques, and Israel helped fund some of those projects. Most American politicians have no clue about any of this, although the former Republican Congressman Ron Paul once made this point on the floor of the House. Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. Arafat himself told an Italian newspaper, quote, Hamas is a creature of Israel. He even claimed that former Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin admitted as much to him, calling it a fatal error. Now, you might be wondering, why should I believe mad Ron Paul or the famously shady Yasser Arafat? Well, you don't have to. You can believe top Israeli and US officials who've basically owned up to all this. Brigadier Yitzhak Segev, for example, who was the Israeli military governor in Gaza and later told the New York Times reporter that he helped finance the Islamic movement. The Israeli government gave me a budget, he said, and the military government gives to the mosques. Colonel David Hakam, who worked in Gaza in the late 1980s as an Arab affairs expert in the Israeli military, has admitted that the original sin was Israeli support for Yassin in the late 70s. But at the time, he has argued, nobody thought about the possible results. Well, Avner Cohen did. Cohen was the Israeli official who was responsible for religious affairs in Gaza for more than two decades, and who now says, quote, Hamas, to my great regret, is Israel's creation. Yeah. Cohen's words. He actually wrote an official report to his superiors in the mid-1980s, warning them not to play divide and rule in the occupied territories, and calling on Israel to, quote, break up this monster before this reality jumps in our face. But no one else on the Israeli side really took the possibility of blowback seriously at that time. They never do, do they? Hamas has since killed far more Israeli civilians than any secular Palestinian militant group, and its leaders have been pretty viciously anti-Israeli and even anti-Semitic in their rhetoric. Sheikh Yassin would eventually be assassinated by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. Sheikh Yassin and its organization, the Hamas, are responsible to the killings of more than 400 Israelis. So the question shouldn't be, why now? I think it should be, why not before? Why not before? Well, because before, Israel was actually nudging and winking at Yassin and co, building them up as a rival to Arafat's Fatah. The die was cast for blowback. <laughs>
blowback, incidentally, that they decided to double down on when they assassinated Yassin. You can hear the crowds chanting for Hamas, and any idea that this operation would actually suppress or diminish that organization seems to be ill-judged. The inconvenient truth is that Hamas is in part a creature of Israel's own making, an enemy that Israel spent more than 20 years helping to build up and then spent the next 20 years, the past 20 years that is, trying to bomb, besiege, and blockade out of existence. The three Gaza wars fought by Israel against Hamas since 2008 killed around 2,000 Palestinian civilians and a dozen Israeli civilians. That's the real human cost of blowback. David Long, a former Middle East expert at the US State Department under Ronald Reagan, told journalist Robert Dreyfus, I thought the Israelis were playing with fire. I didn't realize they'd end up creating a monster. But I don't think you ought to mess around with potential fanatics. It's a lesson both the Israelis and the Americans never seem to learn, though. And as usual, innocent people, in this case Palestinians and Israelis, continue to lose their lives as a result.